I lived uh, in Ramallah until I was, uh, I finished high school. I was uh, 17. I feel like I didn't leave. Uh, some part of me is still kind of feels like I'm still there, even though I've reached uh, like a year ago, the, the cusp of like half of my life was in Palestine, the other half was outside. I still feel like I'm still, my home is still there, all my family is there. But at that point I left because I finished high school and I wanted to get um, a college education and it was during the first intifada and the schools were hardly operating, let alone colleges or universities. The life was very, very focused on a collective effort of uh, resistance. And so there's a lot of things that people gave up. Uh, but there were also things that were taken away from us, uh, very basic things, uh, such as like the right to for education. And so um, our school was constantly closed because it was the excuse that the Israeli military gave and the Israeli occupation gave was the fact that it's a site of congregation. That was reason enough to close the school constantly. And there were a couple of years where the, the school was closed for the majority of the year. Um, again, luckily, uh, there were a couple of options. One was because during the first intifada, it was very based on uh, social and community service. And so a lot of the homes, the mosques, the churches turned into centers for education and for social activities because they had to substitute. Similar like how your backyard garden turned into your, you know, vegetable market because it was closed. We, it was constantly on strike. It was a very uh, unique time because uh, it was whole, it was safe in a different way. Um, I mean, there was a lot of Israeli killings and abductions and arrests, but within your community you felt complete. Um, it was very, very, uh, you know, honest, true resistance to occupation, especially in the first uh, Intifada. And of course, I acknowledge it could be part of nostalgia and part of, you know, naivety at that age, but it felt very cohesive and it felt um, that maybe you, maybe euphoric at that time because it was very clear what we were striving for and it was very simple and clear it was you know your right for freedom and your right for liberation. At the same time it was a very fragile time uh, because everything was at stake. Um, sorry. Um, and sometimes it takes a while to kind of process a lot of that. Um, I mean, things that I'm lucky that I survived through, and I'm, again, consider myself very fortunate, but a lot of the things that you go through and the things that you experience, you know, personally and the things that you see, you carry with you. And, uh, you know, I, I had lost a cousin who was found um, at the age of 13 in, in, the, uh, in the woods, like he was found by a shepherd and he was beaten up. That's a loss of life, a loss of a person. But it doesn't even signify everything else that people, you know, live through when you're under occupation. And I think, you know, to me, the things that I saw and witnessed firsthand were probably the most impactful in terms of my memory. And you're right, I actually reflect on them right now. I have specific moments of reflection of like these lessons of, you know, what what was a martyr? You know, that was a martyr. That was my cousin was a martyr. What, a, what is a prisoner? You know, my brother was shot and imprisoned. You know, what is a deportee? My other brother was deported for a year. And those memories become your knowledge. At least once a year I go. I love going there to feel at home with my family, but also to feel that specific things that are related to me, my personal growth there, my personal memories there. Driving by and seeing a kid like climb a tree flat, gives you a huge flashback and reminds me of that purity and, and that freedom of being a child and growing in Palestine, growing so close to the land, um, going to harvest you know, with my grandma, 
um, the olive trees and like how those days some seemed endless like not because they were long but just like they kind of like laid out uh, you know for the entire day um, you could feel every minute of it but they never were tiring to me at least uh, it felt because everyone was there the whole family you would eat you would play um, you didn't have to go back home <laughs> until the days end. Uh, the day ends um, so those memories are, are still very alive you know I have like this memory of um, I was eating a peach the other day and peaches here suck generally but like <laughs> if you do find a good peach that's like juicy and smells amazing and it's to me that's a reflection I'm eventually a peasant I, I, I believe down the line like my roots go back to that and so a lot of senses are triggered by food and fruits and um, and I remembered after finishing it, you know, the seed is so amazing, actually, of the peach uh, fruit. It's so brilliant. Uh, red burgundy and carving in it is really intricate carving. And I remembered, you know, my mom used to always um, keep the seed of the peach in her pocket. And then after she passed away, uh, I, I was actually... I was in college the last semester and then she pa she went into coma when I was the last semester and I went back home and she was holding on until I arrived and then like two hours she passed away and um, uh, me being the un the only unmarried younger of the seven siblings they told me that I was like charged with the task of like organizing the home and like figuring out who gets what where things go because my brother's family was moving in um, and I went through her stuff and in every jacket that she had or every pant that she had there was like a peach like a dry uh, peach seed and that to me like whenever I see a peach now like that signifies so much of my mom the land and maybe the loss as well um, but also like the happiness of like you know what I'm what I come from what I had to experience and and live through um, but those those memories are very alive and like they're what makes things easier uh, living here. I have my mom's uh, dress. Uh, it's an embroidered dress and it's like uh, it's a very very old dress. It's supposed to be now almost coming to like a hundred years uh, old and it's from Bethlehem and it used to be like the most valued dress uh, women would wear it on their weddings. Um, as their wedding dress um, but later on it became like the mother of the bride would wear it uh, or the relatives of the bride and the groom uh, would wear it and so when I, I was I was saying when I um, when my mom passed away I was the one you know tasked with organizing the house and distributing things and organizing things and of course I really I wasn't living back home and so I didn't want to take anything you know big or um, or something that is heavy. My mom used to wear traditional and modern, both. Like, she didn't want to be stuck to either one, which was incredible. Like, she didn't, she wanted to feel that fluidity, um, and she didn't want to cover either. And um, and so my sisters were mainly wearing, they wear modern clothes, and so they didn't care that much about the, the dresses. But growing up, I always saw my mom uh, design those dresses and the intricacies of choosing the pattern and the meaning of each pattern how one means the sun one means the pine tree one means a moon all those things you know as I was growing up I learned them and how she selected the colors so smartly the one that I have is the older traditional one which is from Bethlehem which I adore and it gives me comfort to see it to touch it to smell it um, a lot and that's probably, I mean, I have other things, but to me, that's uh, the most precious.